the local legend is Kamehameha the Great was born in Mo'okini the same night the Haley's Bop Comet was in the night sky. The historical fact we do know is the next part is that he was trained by his uncle in the similar area to where we're in now, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, to become a warrior. We don't know his, for a documented fact how great of a warrior he became known as. However, we do know he was trained to become a warrior. The local legend is he became known as the most fierce warrior in all of Hawaii name. Well, when he was 16, we do, do know he traveled to Hilo to attempt to lift the Naha Stone. This would have been close to when the first British commander arrived in Hawaii in 1778, Captain Cook. Well, <clears throat> based on first-hand accounts, the people that witnessed it told the people of European descent who wrote it down in journals. They say Kamehameha the Great at 16 lifted the Naha Stone off the ground. They do not know how high off the ground. They don't know if it was one side or the whole rock. But I would have to estimate this rock being about 3,000 pounds. Um, that's an estimate. It's a massive rock. And the local legend is not only did he lift it off the ground, but he curled it into his arms like a baby. That is the local legend. That cannot be considered historical fact, however. Like I said, based on the first-hand accounts, he lifted it off the ground. Well, everything past that point is all well documented historically, and it's taken as fact. You can read about it on the USGS website, like I said before, as well as the Pu'ukohola National Park website, where they'll, they'll tell you the similar history. Probably much more detailed than the history I'll tell you right now, but it goes rather well with that prophecy, like I said before. So the year is 1788, um, 10 years after Europeans made it to Hawaii. There's a huge battle that breaks out on each of the Hawaiian islands for dominance over the island as soon as Europeans get here. It's a strength in numbers. We wanted a solidified front or unified front so that we'd be less likely to get taken over. We actually had, it had the opposite effect in that we started killing each other off. And so 1788, it had been such a bloody war on our island that there's only two militaries left. The military of Kamehameha the Great and the military of Keoa, his first cousin once again. And they were fighting for control of this island. And near a place called the Kaka Falls on our island, there is a battle that takes place between Keoa and Kamehameha the Great's military. Keoa defeats Kamehameha the Great's warriors and actually makes them retreat all the way to the west side of our island to an area called Kauai Hai. Well, <coughs> Keoa, normally they would have followed those warriors, trailing them to try to make another battle because he felt that one more battle, he would be able to defeat Kamehameha the Great completely and he would take control of this island. So Kamehameha's scouts would have been looking towards the east, thinking Keoa was following them. So he had an idea to take his troops to the south and come up from the south where the scouts would not be looking. Flank Kamehameha the Great and his warriors and take control of this island. They had planned to be in what today is known as Keonehelele, about two miles by the way the bird flows in that direction to my left. Well, they, their plan was to camp there one night. Now then they would continue their march. Well. <clears throat> that same night, 308 warriors were camped at Keonehelele. That is the bulk of Keoa's army. They'd been whittled down to small numbers. And he was still winning this war. Keoa and 11 other Ali'i chiefs were camped towards Hilo from Keonehelele. That same night, there's an unusual eruption of Kilauea. It's so unusual, we say Pelehonuamea had so much rage in her that she obliterated the rocks into ash. This eruption only lasted a few hours. And the 308 warriors at Keonehelele imagined them in 1788 sleeping in the middle of the night, getting thrown into the air for what they feel is an earthquake. However, it's really a volcanic eruption. They began getting pelted with hot rocks as the, that's the first part of the earth that gets blasted out. And then they start to run. And then all the ash that was blasted out of that area, well, it begins to settle and they begin to breathe it in. That asphyxiates you. It slowly chokes you. Well, it happened to be misting that night as well. And whenever ash mixes with water, you get a wet cement-like substance that began falling to the ground as well. So it's called Footprints Trail today because what you see if you went out there today are footprints actually casted in to the ground of those warriors running for their lives from that eruption. Eventually, all 308 warriors succumbed. They died due to the eruption. So you see footprints, and then you see a big indentation, an imprint where their bodies fell. Again, all 308 warriors dying in the eruption of 17, 1788. Now Keoa though, he knew there was an eruption, but he was upwind, so he was, didn't get any of that ash. And those 11 other chief warriors, the head chiefs, and 
they don't know all their warriors have died, however. And so the next day they're following the troops, their other group. And they came upon the area of Keonehelele. All of the warriors, their infantry had fallen. They know this prophecy. They know the next part. They had just lost the war for our island. Kamehameha the Great had just won and he doesn't even know it yet based on this eruption. And again, it only lasted a few hours. Rather coincidental, to say the least. We say that was Pele Honuamea giving her sign. Maybe it was just chance. Well, <clears throat> Keoa went back towards Hilo, where he's from, and spent time with his family because he knew what was going to happen next. He knew his destiny already. Well, word gets back to Kamehameha the Great, who begins building what today is called Pu'ukohola pu um, National Park. Back then, Pu'ukohola Luakini Heao. And it's the temple dedicated to the war god, Kuilaomoku. Well, it takes him two years to finish the building of the temple, taking the rocks from 30 miles away, Pololu Valley, because they had to be those sacred rocks. And in 1790, he has the dedication ceremonies to Pu'ukohola. He sends an invitation out to his first cousin, Keoa, to be the guest of honor at the opening ceremonies. <laughs> now, I this is unbelievable to me, but people do all kinds of things for their religion, conviction, things of that nature. The conviction's amazing because Keoa believed that his destiny was to be sacrificed at that temple, that he willingly set sacrifice with those 11 other chiefs that were camped with them to their own deaths, willingly set sail. That is absolutely unbelievable to me. Um, I can't imagine. Now, they didn't agree with it, as I wouldn't, but they knew it was their destiny. And so what they did is they stopped about a mile from Pelekane Bay, where the temple was built in Kauai High, and they make themselves less fit sacrifices out of protest. But they could have made themselves unfit sacrifices, but they chose not to. They just made themselves less fit. It was their last form of protest. Before sailing the next mile to the beaches of Pelekane Bay, where it said Kamehameha the Great was standing on the beaches with open arms, welcoming in his first cousin as family. Well, <clears throat> upon stepping off the canoe, Keoa and Kamehameha the Great greet each other with the traditional greeting in Old Hawaii, touching foreheads and noses, breathing out of your nose, sharing your mana, your life, your force with them. Never breathing out of your mouth, though, which is considered a huge, huge, um, like, diss. And that's because <laughs> your mouth says dirty things. It's a dirty place. That's where you can talk bad about people. Um, you can lie from it. And so it was considered totally not good if you were to breathe from your mouth onto someone, onto your nose. But after this, the exchange of ha, um, Kamehameha the Great actually has a knife that he, that he got from one of the Europeans he traded with earlier, since they had been there for 10 years, and he stabs Keoa, killing him, right there on the beaches of Pelikane Bay. He then takes the body up and finishes the ritual sacrifice at the temple. Subsequently, the 11 other warriors are sacrificed after Keoa. And now this is historical fact. Like you said, you go to the, you go to the National Historical Park and they'll tell you the same story. Um, we say that appeases the war god, Kuilaomoku. That obviously cannot be substantiated as historical fact. However, rather coincidentally, the rest of the prophecy says he should be able to take over the other islands with ease. Well, two men show back up in Hawaii now led by George Vancouver, one's American, John Young, one's British, Isaac Davis. And they were taken prisoner earlier by a young Kamehameha the Great. And they negotiated a settlement for their freedom. And this is a time period when we only have old battle implements, spears, clubs, rocks even at times. No guns or cannons, westernized weapons. Well, they negotiate with a young Kamehameha the Great earlier and they actually negotiate for their freedom in exchange for a future stake in Kamehameha the Great's kingdom if they brought back guns and cannons from Great Britain. Well, shortly after Keoa's sacrificed, those two British, or one American, one British gentleman, arrived back in Hawaii on the ships that were sailed here for, in the first place by Captain Cook, now led by Commander George Vancouver. And they have guns and cannons for Kamehameha the Great's warriors, and they teach them how to use them. They outfit his canoes with cannons and they actually set sail for the island of Maui. And this is late 1790, where the warriors of Maui are waiting on the beaches of Kakui Heba with the old battle implements. Kamehameha the Great and his warriors, along with the British, with the westernized guns and cannons. And they slaughter the warriors of Maui on the beaches of Kakui Heba in one battle, taking over the island of Maui. 
They then set sail in early 1791 after getting more supplies to the island of Oahu, where their warriors are waiting with a few westernized weapons, but mostly the old battle implements. And this is the most famous of all Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian battles, the Battle of Nu'u'anu Pali, a thousand foot cliff that gently slopes to that cliffside, where the warriors of Oahu are completely, completely inundated at first and they retreat up the gentle slope. They come to the cliffs. They have two choices, put up a fight there and they're gonna die, or jump, and they're gonna die. And so every warrior at the Battle of Nu'uanu Pali chooses to jump to their own deaths, rather than die by Kamehameha the Great and the British's weapons. And so, um, I don't know why he's parked all the way down here. Um, so, the Battle of Nu'uanu Pali, all of them jump to their own suicides, all the warriors of Oahu. That's why it's such a famous battle, not that it was much of a battle, but that it was what happened, and so, um, they did put up a valiant effort, however, but that one battle, the island of Oahu, was now under the control of Kamehameha the Great. And then I'll tell you guys the rest after dinner since we're here.